Okay, thank you. How good to be here for another full <coughs> and vibrant and challenging pink therapy conference. Uh, I founded the first professional organization in Britain for queer issues in therapy and related fields, which was called the Association for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual Psychologies in 1992. And I've been passionately committed to moving this work forward ever since. I've been a humanistic and formative therapist, a supervisor and trainer for 25 years, and an honorary clinical associate at Pink Therapy since its inception. And Dominic and I co-edited the Pink Therapy trilogy together in 96 and 2000. So that bit. Okay. Love is hard to pin down, isn't it? It's difficult to be precise with labels or to make boundaries for our feelings. Same-sex desire, multi-sex desire and asexuality have been part of human experience since the earliest recorded times. In 1800 BC, a poet writes of a god seducing a young man with, what a lovely bum you have. This seems not, however, to have defined a person's identity as it has come to do in more modern times. Indeed, most of the labels that we are still using for our loves and desires are 19th century inventions. Until the 1850s, people were not really defined, and nor did they define themselves, as altogether different from other people by virtue of their desires and sexualities. It is, of course, our biological imperative as a species for most of us to reproduce and to provide care for our exceptionally dependent young within our tribes, while others full, uh, fill vital alternative roles. In some societies, therefore, same-sex love has always been accepted or tolerated, provided it did not interfere with one fulfilling one's social roles by marrying and having children. And this is as true today as in earlier histories worldwide. Censorship, persecution and silence have, however, largely written same-sex desire out of history. Latterly, queer studies have helped to show us that heteronormativity is not so normal after all. A more complex and a more interesting view of the world is becoming increasingly possible. Our own history at Pink Therapy describes an interesting trajectory. The ALGBP arguments with European colleagues in the early 90s echo Cameron's last week we were fighting for the UK division to be treated differently as we would not accept their exclusion of non-psychologists or of bisexuals. The first Pink Therapy book was called uh, Therapy with L, L, G and B. The next two, L, G, B and T. And we've now moved from being sexual minorities almost all the way to claiming majority status as wide communities of gender and sexual diversities. I was moved to make this book, The Marrying Kind, by the life stories of many men coming to my bi and gay men's therapy group over 25 years, or to see me individually, who were in turmoil about the impact that their same-sex desire was having, or had had or could have, on their marriage to a woman. I had myself been heterosexually married at 20 for 12 years, though my wife knew that I was bi when we met and sexuality played almost no part in our separation. <coughs> it was apparent that there existed no helpful resource materials in a British context or any published examples of similar struggles to model the varying possibilities of resolution. So I had, as is common, both professional and personal motives for writing the book, 
and aim to provide a substantial resource pack for other men struggling with these issues, as well as for their families, friends and others working to support them. So the book includes 35 pages of resources for support and information. Up until now, the vast majority of resources, largely American, had supported heterosexual spouses, usually wives. The book takes the form of ten distinct life stories told through therapeutic conversations. For some participants, this was a second therapy with me, conversations between a man and myself where I attempt to push the other into deeper inquiry and reflection. These were conducted mostly in written dialogues over a year or more, although two were audio recording. Each one courageously gives voice to their unique journey through frustration, heartbreak, loneliness and fear to realness and truth. All were keen to contribute useful material to help others as well as to having their own stories acknowledged. The men varied hugely in their ability and willingness to go deeper or further in relation to my questioning, and that, of course, is itself telling. Their own biographies, their relations with wives and children, and their attitudes and understandings of sex, sexualities and gender also varied widely, as you would expect. No two men, no two wives, no two marriages or contexts are the same. And therefore, neither can constructive solutions for one <coughs> rightly be applied elsewhere. Each relationship is co-constructed by the participants and has meanings and nuances which only they know, or of which even they may not be consciously aware how they met and started to relate, how they have transformed together or fallen apart, the ways that they've made other loving connections or not, their social contexts, all of these derived from their unique patterns for relating, which were developed within their families and contexts of origin. They are also naturally formed through the journeys that they have made themselves and the work that they have been prepared or able to undertake in order to grow. However, some common threads emerge. These include inherited and internalized oppression, creating guilt and shame, and consequent wish to overcome, repress, or outgrow their same-sex desires. Many feared exposure and the loss of love, family and stability, at the same time as yearning to be more truly known. The desire to parent was a keen driving factor, one so often ignored in men, and the loss of the heterosexual dream so rarely acknowledged by gay men. There was often a genuine, as far as I'm from Meg John, there was often a genuine sexual or romantic attachment to the wife, as well as an interesting history of seeking to be pleasing to women, often shaped by mothers. Many feared what being queer would mean and dreaded entering gay scenes of their fantasies. Several had been badly hurt or afraid when they attempted to connect, to belong, to find their place in existing scenes. A few men were formed in relation to strong religious beliefs and usually felt betrayed by their faiths. All experienced crushing loneliness and lack of community and several went through painful suicidal depressions often lasting for decades. <coughs> Every type of compulsive and compensatory behaviour was employed in the process. Two were sexually abused as children, causing confusion in them about their orientation and desires. Two had physical disabilities for which they were already being persecuted when young. 
Two were boarding school survivors yet to work on the consequences of that for intimacy. One guy and his wife had a non-sexual or asexual relationship and do so still. One was a damaged survivor of conversion therapy in the States with fundamentalist Christians and desperate for help to recover. Uh, I would say three or four would, identif would not identify as bi because of the pressures that you were talking about, Meg John but whose behaviours uh, definitely would, would be, we would call by. Um, okay, and actually it was the men, three of the men who came nearest to identifying as by who remained in some way married to the woman. So that's interesting. Uh, in our culture, there are very durable notions presuming that gay and bi males cannot stay married or make their futures work well with heterosexual women. Emergent ideas in the United States of mixed orientation <coughs> marriages are more helpful. And I wonder whether we might think later today about whether the same kinds of stories will be related in 10 years' time or tw 20 years' time, or whether people will begin to feel that fluidity is so much more acceptable that they might contract to be married to anyone, regardless of genitals. <coughs> uh, one problem in our thinking arises from a presumption that homosexuality and heterosexuality are entirely different and separate from each other almost opposites. Since the so-called age of reason in Western thought, we have been wedded to binary hierarchical ideas like opposite sexes. We can only be one or the other, male or female, gay or straight, respectably married or queer adventurer. One is always held to be right or superior, while one is lesser, unnatural, even immoral. Whereas, in fact, as with everything to do with sex and gender and humanness, the reality is complex. The reality is that they intersect, overlap and seed one into another. Nothing is in fact opposed. In these life stories, these tendencies can be detected in ideas of becoming gay or by, or being no longer straight. And of course, within the relationships described, these perceived changes cause confusion, hurt, and anger. It seems as if somehow a person is no longer what they were, no longer what others believed they knew them to be. And this looks like cheating. The mental constructions of sexualities and genders belie the complexities and subtleties of our lived experience. Sex and love, relationships and desires are in fact processes and continua. They are not things. They are multi-layered and pulsatory, rich and growing. A major theme then of the book is that life is so much richer and the opportunities for happiness so much greater in all of us in authentic relationships. I hope the book speaks to anyone concerned with this, whatever their orientation, and that it opens up wider issues about what marriage, parenting, family and relationship might mean. Outcomes vary just as much and naturally also depended on the uniqueness of the relationships. Three remained married after a coming out process with a range of revisions to the contract between them from don't ask, don't tell to a resumed secret life to working through the process continuously together. A few men did lose their families, friends, home and church some also made enriching new loving relationships or came out in new creative ways. One remained unable to truly confront the situation with his wife and family. Importantly, what is clear is that there is no inevitable next step. 
In the end, I was persuaded to include my own life story in the same form to underline the authenticity of the project. My heterosexual female wife and I had 12 mostly happy years together, during which we parented two boys who are now models of what men can be. I have lived with my husband now for 34 years and our co-parenting expanded when he became an actively involved donor dad to another son 12 years ago for lesbian friends. We are now also granddads to two infant girls. You will understand perhaps why my preference is not to categorise myself at all <coughs> and certainly not to categorise myself according to the genitals of my partner. I'm attracted by many more things than that in other people, as well as that. Uh, so, marrying kind is about therapy and its abuses, uh, uses and abuses too. Although sexuality and gender have always been targeted and policed by those gaining the most power from hierarchies of desire, of expression, of loving and relating, I see growth and development today which makes me optimistic that after 150 years we may finally be moving away from the roots of psychotherapy in pathology, in medicalization, in categorizing and cures towards greater authenticity and greater recognition of the uniqueness of our individual lives and loves. One fascinating and confusing footnote to this project has been the almost total lack of support or interest for the book from gay and bi media, reviewers, therapy training courses or organisations in Britain, despite extensive and expensive publicity attempts. My dear friend Dominic has been fulsome in recommending it as captivating and ruthlessly honest while Peter Tatchell called it truly groundbreaking and treating of a much neglected area of people's lives. Michael Cashman said its importance would be just as great in less tolerant and understanding parts of the world, and it would be wonderful if that became true. But it has been the Daily Mail, the Sunday Times, and the Americans who have so far shown the most interest in it, and I'm not sure what we can learn from that. <laughs> Except that it looks like there's lots more for us still to do to support each other, and this conference is a part of that. Thanks. Thank